Okay, so um, you've heard a very sort of generous version of what I do at the moment, but I'm going to go way back in time and just kind of start by telling you how I got to this point. So um, I started medical school when I was 17. I didn't come from any sort of medical world. Um, I'll be unashamed, unashamed in telling you that I chose it because I thought it looked very difficult to do and I thought it would be very challenging. And basically, I therefore didn't have a clue when I started. I, my grounding in knowledge was very weak, and I didn't know how to prioritize things. I just learned by rote in the first instance. Um, but then something happened. I entered hospitals, and I started meeting patients, and there was a pivotal change. So essentially, what a medical student does in hospital is they search out disease. So basically, uh, that's our opportunity to see everything we can possibly see so that we'll recognize it again when we qualify. So we just basically trawl the wards, mithering people, um, the nurses and the doctors, to point us in, in the direction of the interesting patients. We want to listen to the heart murmurs and the crepitations, and we want to test the abnormal reflexes. So essentially what we're on a search for is objective signs of disease. And essentially, that's how it begins. That's the point at which we begin stratifying suffering in a very particular way, from sort of worst to best, according to the burden of the organic pathology that's found, not really taking into account at all how the patient feels or the, their level of disability. Now, I should say that there is a point at which we do have to learn all those facts, and we do have to see those diseases, and that does have to be done, and some diseases need to be acted on more quickly than others. But where the problem in that arises is that the world of actual clinical practice in medicine is not only inhabited by people with diseases, far from it. About one in three people who go and see their GP on any given day have medically unexplainable physical complaints. One in three people who go to a neurology clinic have something like dizziness, headaches, um, paralysis, seizures, memory impairment that cannot be explained by any brain disease. In the sort of epilepsy clinic that I run, one in five people who come with intractable seizures don't have epilepsy. Um, they actually have a thing called um, dissociative seizures. What I'm referring to in each of these medically unexplainable groups, the one in three at the GP, the one in five in an epilepsy clinic, is most of these people suffer with something called a psychosomatic disorder. And that's where you get real physical disability, which cannot be explained either on medical tests or on examination. These are things that are psychologically or behaviorally driven. I want to sort of make the distinction between disease, which is a pathological process, and illness, which is a subjective sense of how one feels. And what medical students are taught to do is they're taught to rule in and out disease, um, but not what to do once the disease has been ruled out, but the patient still doesn't feel okay. And once you qualify as a doctor, you're essentially sieving between patients, thousands, hundreds and thousands of people trying to find disease. Um, but the, there's very little emphasis um, when we encounter these patients who are complaining of chronic disabilities, but we cannot explain them through a disease process. And it took a long time for me to kind of understand different ways of suffering. Um, so with that in mind, I do want to just kind of um, tell you about one patient who I met a, a long time ago. Her name was Amanda. So basically... Amanda was perfectly fit and well, and one day um, in her own home, a sort of metal garage door fell and hit her on the lower back. Uh, she got a lot of pain, a lot of bruising. She went to the hospital. They did some investigations and established that, the, you know, she hadn't done any permanent damage um, and that she could expect to get better. Now, she was in a huge amount of pain, and the, the reassurance really didn't help her because she was convinced that she had a more significant injury than that. She began to notice shortly after that she had um, altered sensation in her legs. This progressed until she wasn't able to move her legs until ultimately she ended up in a wheelchair. It progressed further. She then lost the power in one of her arms, so she could only move her left arm very slightly. 
Um, during all of this progressive disability, she was obviously going to hospitals and seeing doctors and having investigations carried out, and all of the investigations were repeatedly normal. She was told that they found no disease, and they reassured her and told her to expect to get it better with physiotherapy. But she was not reassured. Um, unfortunately, doctors expect that if we say to people, your tests are normal, we want you to tell us that you're delighted and then go away, essentially. Um, and basically, that didn't happen with um, Amanda because Amanda got worse and she came back into hospital and I met her at a point where she began to have seizures um, and within a week of being admitted to hospital, she was having about three convulsions a day. Now, as a neurologist, we're in a very particular position with, with people who suffer in this way because the neurological system is unbelievably amenable to measurement. So you can't objectively measure pain. However, you can objectively, objectively measure consciousness. So our brain waves are constantly changing and they're a really accurate reflection of our level of awareness. So it was possible with Amanda to measure her brain waves during one of her seizures and to show that even when she was convulsing and profound, profoundly unconscious, that her brain wave showed a normal waking pattern that we would just expect to see in someone who is awake and well. There's only one way that you can be both unconscious and have a waking brain wave pattern, and that is if the unconsciousness is psychologically driven rather than being due to a brain disease. What's more, examining her legs, etc. Basically, our, our neurological anatomy is arranged um, in such a way that a, a, any lesion at any given point will produce a very specific pattern of disability. Amanda's disability was anatomically impossible. You know, her arm weakness could not be explained by a low back injury. Her, the pattern of weakness in her legs could not be explained by anything anatomical. So it was clear that what Amanda had was what neurologists call a conversion disorder, which is another name for a psychosomatic condition. In other words, her seizures, her paralysis, everything was psychological and behavioral rather than being due to her injury or any other disease process. Now, I realize I'm banding around lots of terms, and it's, it's an issue I have with this disorder, is an awful lot is hidden between woolly, changeable terms. So just to make sure I'm being understood, 100 years ago, Amanda would have been referred to as having hysteria or hysterical seizures. So these seizures would have been considered to be sort of related to an emotional excess um, causing um, a, a physical disability. And you can imagine Amanda came to me as a neurologist. She's expecting me to say that I have found a spinal injury and that she has epilepsy. But instead, I tell her that she has a psychological condition. And that's extremely difficult news to take. What made it doubly difficult is at that time in particular, there was no established treatment pathways for people like Amanda. So she's in a wheelchair, she can't move her left arm, she's having three seizures a day, and the expectation is that someone like that should be discharged from hospital and that treatment can be arranged as an outpatient. If she had epilepsy, I'd be putting her on a drug, referring her to a multidisciplinary team, keeping her in hospital until she got better. But psychological disability, disability for psychological reason just isn't taken seriously because it isn't fatal. So it doesn't take your life, but it does destroy your life. And that seems to allow us to act with less urgency than we would act if somebody had a different sort of illness. Sort of in my own career and all of this difficulty with finding treatment pathways for people like Amanda really um, kind of, I really learned how how neglected this particular patient group is. In 2004, when I finally um, qualified and became a consultant. So I took up a consultancy at the Royal London Hospital in 2004. And a really big part of my job was to look after people who had seizures that weren't getting better with standard treatment. So they were the people who had the most people with epilepsy get better. These were the people who were not getting better. And as it transpired, when I admitted these people to hospital to investigate their seizures, 70% of them were having these same sort of seizures that Amanda had, so they were having dissociative seizures, um, psychologically or behaviorally driven seizures. And there was no treatment facility available for them. And the expectation is that I, as a neurologist, would say that you don't have a neurological disease, so now I'm going to pass you back to your doctor to be looked after in that context. Um, also, people who have these kind of seizures often have multiple disabilities. So I was also seeing people with blindness, memory impairment, um, headaches, dizziness, paralysis, 
because essentially this is a standard part of a neurologist's work. Every neurologist expects to see a large number of patients with these sort of disabilities, but we're not trained really in what we should do about them. And when we pass the information on to the patient that they have one of these disorders, they are invariably mystified, which has always mystified me, because if this is so common, and I'm seeing it in every single clinic that I do, why is it resisted in the way that it is, and why, do pe why are people not talking about it? I mean, one of the issues that patients often raise is they would find the diagnosis easier to accept if, there was a, if we could propose a mechanism or if we had a test that we could do that said that's what it is, a positive test rather than lots of normal tests. Although I have to say that th that argument doesn't fit if you look at other neurological problems. So migraine doesn't have a definite mechanism and it doesn't have a diagnostic test and nobody resists those sort of diagnoses. So it's really the resistance of the diagnosis is about the stigma and about the way we, re we look at these illnesses. And I'm just going to give you a kind of whistle-stop tour through the historical things or just a couple of points in history that I also think bring out important points in the way that we disregard these disorders. So it's important that you realize that hysteria or um, is Greek for womb, basically. And it used to be believed that the womb was a mobile organ and that it moved around the body, causing disease wherever it went. And men could get hysteria, but less, less, much less frequently. In them, it might be attributed to the spleen or the humors or the stomach. But what's also important is the language used for men who had hysteria. One English physician said that they were all pale and effeminate and had flabby, wasted testicles. That's, that is a phrase I never thought I would say in front of a group of people, for sure, um, basically. And, um, you know, so there was, there's, this has always been regarded in, in a very particular way. Um, things did get more scientific around the end of the 19th century with a doctor called Charcot, who's a very eminent neurologist, admired by neurologists, and he worked in Paris. He took this condition seriously for the first time, um, but unfortunately, he also kind of created a veritable circus out of it. So he began displaying his patients at, um, at lessons that were open to not only doctors, but actors and um, painters and, and just general society of Paris. And he showed um, the most bizarre characteristics of hysteria. For example, it's very amenable to suggestion and hypnosis. So he would bring on seizures in his patients and then stop them with hypnosis. He was also able to transfer different disabilities from one patient to the next using a magnet. So on the one hand, he created, um, what it sounds ludicrous to us, some of the things he did, but he was paying extreme scientific attention to these disorders. But I think another point of note is these circuses that he had. He didn't call them a circus, I should add. I'm calling them that. Um, but basically, they, um, they, he, he believed that hysteria was a disease of men as much as it was of women. But all of the people at the open lectures were always his female patients. Um, but what he did do is he created scientific interest in this disorder. So while some things we can sort of look down on and, and consider things that we wouldn't even consider doing now. On the other hand, he brought scientific interest to disorder, and in particular, he brought it to the attention of other extremely powerful people. Um, he changed the course of Freud's career. Freud sent, spent three months with Charcot, and afterwards became interested in hysteria and wrote studies in hysteria, his seminal work about this. It's interesting, it's a book of case histories into which Amanda would sit extremely comfortably. And he had a lot of theories about um, about how the, how the disability was generated. He believed that psychical excitation produced at the time of a trauma with no other outlet became a physical symptom. He believed that the symptoms were symbolic. So if you had something you desperately wanted to tell someone but you couldn't tell them it, then you might develop difficulty speaking or a lump in your throat. And he believed that if you could recognize the trauma or the moment that had produced that symptom that you got this sort of miraculous catharsis and the symptom just kind of disappeared. Now that studies in hysteria was published 100 years ago this year. And what's most astonishing about it is that I'd love to stand up here and tell you about all the wonderful advances since then. But actually, there has been practically no improvement in either making a diagnosis or um, 
or contribution to treatment for these patients until very recently. So only really in the last few years there's a group of doctors in the UK who've become interested in this disorder and are finally beginning to make a bit of a difference. And they're beginning to attack some of the misconceptions. So one of those, Freud suggested that everyone who had hysteria was, had been sexually abused. Now he later abandoned that theory, but many doctors didn't, which led to a situation where doctors were constantly sort of accusing patients of withholding something and patients were saying they didn't. We now know that 30% of people with hysteria have um, suffered a serious abuse, but that means that 70% haven't. There are lots of different mechanisms for this illness. We no longer think of the symptoms as being symbolic, but they do come from somewhere. They come from your imagination, and what's in your imagination is your life experience and your ideas about how the body works and your, uh, your knowledge of anatomy. So just coming back to Amanda, when Amanda injured her back, I mean, she had not had a psychological trauma. She had not suffered abuse. She injured her back, and she was utterly convinced that she had um, spinal injury, and she simply couldn't shake that conviction. And she started paying attention to her legs and looking out for symptoms. We don't normally pay attention to the sensory things. We're always filtering out sensations. So the minute you pay attention, things feel strange. And that ultimately led to her imagining that her legs were getting weak. Movement is automatic. The minute you start paying attention to movement, it, seeks to, it ceases to be automatic any longer. And she had thought herself essentially into disability without any evidence of psychological trauma. And I think studies in hysteria says something very interesting about this. Basically, it says that if an idea can cause you to move, then why shouldn't an idea hinder movement? So I've sort of learned through patients like um, Amanda a lot about these disorders, and I've had a very sort of personal trajectory from not understanding to thinking it's somebody else's problem and then to thinking it's everybody's problem. And the thing that I feel I need to address mostly is the sort of um, the stigma and the disbelief that people hold. So I usually say to people that basically we are all a veritable concert of psychosomatic symptoms. If you stand in front of a room full of people and your voice is breaking and cracking, that is anxiety causing your breathing to change and your vocal cords to change. It's just a physical change in response to emotion. If you've stood on the edge of a diving board and you haven't been able to jump off, that's your mind preventing you from moving. Tears, hands shaking, heart racing, these are all physical responses to emotions. And I want you to think about the important features of these things, which is that they are real, that you're not doing them on purpose, that they're completely out of your control, and the more attention you pay to them, the harder it is to stop them. They're physiological things, but they're not pathological, and they're real, but they're not due to a disease. And basically, you know, it took a long time for me to appreciate those sort of points, um, but I feel like at this point I want to come back to the very beginning. I, I bet I, in my head I can see a little paragraph that I missed out, but I'm going to keep going. Um, I want to come back basically to my starting point, which is basically that we all, you know, I sort of blame medical students um, and the way that we're trained. And I do think that's an issue. We need to be trained how to deal with illness. But I hate for an audience to leave feeling guilt-free. So basically, I do believe that this is really a societal problem more than anything. And in order to kind of make that point, I want you to imagine that Amanda is your work colleague and that you've seen her progressively descend into a wheelchair and she's off work. And you hear in the first instance that she has multiple sclerosis. And then over the course of time, you discover that Amanda's in a wheelchair, but she doesn't have multiple sclerosis, that her problem's psychological and that her legs can move, but they simply won't. And I think in that situation, most of us do sort of have a tilt in our attitude or a complete turn in our attitude or the amount of sympathy we're willing to give a person like that. And that's really what I am here to address. Thank you. Thank you.